I'm Eugenie Tsai, the John and Barbara Vogelstein Senior Curator of Contemporary Art at the Brooklyn Museum. It's my pleasure to be here today and to talk to you a little bit about Byron Kim. The title of my remarks today is Observations on the Art of Byron Kim. And here he is. It's my pleasure today to speak to you about Byron Kim, an artist I've known over 30 years and whose exhibition Threshold I organized in 2004. We met around 1990 through our association with Godzilla, Asian American Art Network. This was an advocacy group founded by three Asian diasporic artists. The purpose of the group was to heighten the visibility of Asian American artists and arts professionals. This was at a moment when an interest in multiculturalism and identity politics had emerged. The context in which Byron's work came to art world attention when it appeared in the 1993 Whitney Biennial. I'm going to begin by talking about the synecdoche painting that marked Byron's entrance into the art world and that has become his signature work. The title itself is a literary term denoting the use of a part to stand in for the whole. Of course, the choice of a literary term is not surprising as Byron was an English major at Yale University where he received his BA in the 1980s. As you can see, Synecdoche presents a group of small rectangular panels that hang in a grid to create a larger monochrome painting in different shades, ranging from light tan to dark brown. Each panel represents an individual. The names of the sitters are listed on the wall as part of the work. I'm sorry, I don't have the label here. The paintings are simultaneously figurative and abstract. This is what we might think of as a both and approach that Byron embraces in place of the duality of binaries that are so often found in discussions of Western art. And these are just uh, pictures of me in Byron's studio in 2017 to give you a sense of how the paintings are made. Each eight by 10 inch panel of the painting involves an in-person sitting. So it's like a portrait. Uh, on the left, you can see my right forearm, which Byron is matching with um, paint on a coated piece of paper. And on the right side, you can see him sitting there with his paper palette, mixing colors um, to, to make the match. So the following year, I went to the National Gallery in Washington and found myself in front of Byron's very large Synecdoche painting of 2018. Uh, I looked at the label on the wall and was excited to see that I appeared in the upper right side of the painting, the upper right corner, although I don't know exactly, I can't identify from memory where exactly it was. And I was not far from Unji Ju, a friend and curator of contemporary art at SF MoMA. I'm just gonna show you a slide I took on my phone to give you a sense of scale with some of the viewers in the gallery and a better sense of the color, which is more vibrant than um, the larger slide I just showed. Byron's decision to name the individuals included in each painting underscores the representational aspect of synecdoche paintings, as well as the community that this group of individual creates visually on the wall. And if you think about it, the community can ex expand infinitely. I was also happy to see that Byron's painting was presented in close proximity to works by the artists Janine Antoni and Glenn Ligon. They were all included in the 1993 Whitney Biennial and became lifelong friends. As a student at Yale, Byron became interested in abstract painting, 
both for its art historical role and the broader cultural implications. In a polemical essay of 1992, he outlined his views on 20th century abstraction as they evolved over the course of his undergraduate studies. The title of his essay was An Attempt at Dogma, which he published in a Godzilla newsletter. The title was a tribute to the painter Ad Reinhardt, a renowned New York school painter whose large black canvases from the 1960s are legendary for their austerity. Uh, this is just a slide I got off the internet that shows you a series of those large black, very spare paintings by Ad Reinhardt. Um, so I'm not going to discuss Byron's essay in its entirety here, but want to mention a couple of key points that illuminate his views on abstraction. Byron wrote, I am especially interested in paintings that deal in the extreme of abstraction, particularly abstract monochrome paintings and the notion that these paintings had a special spiritually advanced standing and also somehow stood at the end of art history. Another issue Byron addressed was, was the exclusivity of the club of abstract painters, a club that seemed devoid of artists of color. He said, before I'm through making monochromes, I'd like to make some large paintings exactly like Bryce Marden's Grove Group. And this is Grove Group One in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. It's a little bit greener in, in real life, uh, it's just, but you get the general idea. He went on to say, and I mean exactly like his, except I painted them. These paintings would respond directly to those who ask me, why are you making abstract paintings? The you, meaning Asian American artists, artists of color, artists with something to say. Of course, my intention would be to make this line of questioning the inevitable content of the one that would dominate the ostensible, conventionally romantic content. So the Synecdoche paintings can be seen as melding Byron's interest in the formal lineage of American abstraction and timely cultural implications of race and representation, issues from the 90s that remain very pertinent today. This solution incorporates the formal language and universality of abstraction with content, the idea that artists of color are expected to make work about their identity. Just another variation on the synecdoche paintings. Um, from a painter's point of view, the surface of the painting is sometimes thought of as a membrane akin to skin. But the color of skin denotes race and seems very much to encapsulate the ethos of the early multicultural 90s. The synecdoche paintings have left people thinking of Byron as the, the skin guy a moniker that stuck with him as the series has continued into the present with various commissions of group portraits by boards of museums and other organizations. Uh, this is an installation of a show from 2016 called Mud, Root, Ochre, Leaf and Star at James Cohan Gallery. In this exhibition, Byron explored the surface of the skin in a much different fashion. Large single canvases focused on a small section of what appears to be bruised flesh. And I'm just showing you two examples, blue lipped sandalwood fall and evidence of struggle. Once again, the paintings grow out of a literary source. Byron was inspired by the poem, All But Innocence, by the contemporary poet, Carl Phillips. In this poem, the poet meditates on a lover's bruise, something like amber and compares it to meat, soil and a landscape. Here, the surface of the painting really does 
seem like skin. These canvases are not so much painted as stained, a kind of riff on color field painting. Byron boiled and dyed fabrics before stretching them onto frames and painted with rags soaked in glue or oil and natural pigments. Writing about these works, the critic Ryan Wong remarked, the paintings radiate tenderness and hurt. Wong went on to write about synecdoche and the bruise painting saying, the two bodies of work feel like a parable of racial possibility in the US. The 90s promised multicultural harmony. We only needed to diversify, make room for many colors. Today, the resurgence of white nationalism, police brutality, and the end of the Obama years have shown the limit of that narrative. It's not enough to see skin. Can we reckon with the violence and healing it carries beneath? So this is Ryan writing in 2016. And once again, the cultural context seems to have shaped the reception of Byron's paintings. Of course, in this year, Trump was elected and Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement was actively protesting police brutality. If we back up to Bryce, to Byron's comments about, about Bryce Martin, I'd like to show a couple of examples of Byron's series of paintings from 1994, the Celadon paintings, a series of monochrome canvases. These directly reference his Korean heritage. Celadon is a ceramic glaze characterized by hues and a range of blue to gray green tones. Although the glaze originated in China, it's associated in Korea with the Koryo dynasty from the 10th to the 14th century. Byron describes his terrible experience of dropping an exquisite 800 year old Celadon cup, which was a gift from his parents. It had a handle that was in the shape of a dragon's head. As he looked at the fragments lying on the floor, he saw that the cup had an ordinary cement colored body to which the brittle glaze was adhered. This made him realize how close the potter's process is to that of the painter and how appropriate it would be to resurrect this experiment in gray green through abstract painting. So Byron Celadon paintings seem to be his response to and his redoing of Bryce Martin. One of the things he admired about Martin's paintings was the tactile feeling of color, which gave the canvas the look and feel of an object. Martin achieved this effect by max mixing wax with pigment. Here Byron seems to be drawing analogies between the skin of an American abstract painting and the glazed surface of an Asian ceramic celadon cup. And he's making a point about cultural conventions of beauty. Just as the transcendent beauty of abstract canvases by painters like Reinhardt and Martin can only be appreciated by those schooled in those conventions, so is the beauty of Celadon appreciated by Koreans because it is a culturally ingrained commonplace. Uh, and just to show you the range, he did large monochromes and then he did smaller, um, I think these are on panel. And you can see the ranges uh, of the kind of gray, blue, and green that match the ceramic glazes. Following the Whitney Biennial, Byron started a series of paintings that examines the link between color and memories of place. These look back to the years of his childhood spent near Hartford, Connecticut and his early adulthood in Brooklyn before becoming a parent. Here you're looking at a painting called 46 Halsey Drive, Wallingford, Connecticut, 06492, which represents Byron's attempts to recreate the color of the family home 
his childhood family home on the basis of the combined memories of himself, his parents, and his sister. Each family member selected paint chips they felt most closely approximated the color of the house. And Byron took these colors and painted them on bands across um, the, this vertical board of the painting. You can see that the painting leans against the wall like an object mirroring the house as a structure. One of the most endearing of these canvases is called Miss Mashinsky, First Big Crush from 1996. This is a small canvas composed of dark, of green and dark blue stripes. It's hard to see in this slide, and I apologize. The stripes refer to the turtleneck shirt Byron was wearing one day when his first grade teacher, Miss Mashinsky, told him she liked it. This resulted in his wearing it for three straight weeks. Moving from childhood memories to young adulthood, Metropolitan Pool, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, 1994, shows green and mustard panels, which recall the walls of a community swimming pool he frequented while living in the neighborhood. And in 1984 Dodge Wagon, a painting from 1994, three panels in brown and buff memorialize the artist's beloved Dodge Aries station wagon. Byron refers to this group of paintings as spots of time, a phrase from the prelude a poem by the British romantic poet Williams, William Wordsworth. Again, think back to his major as a, a liter his literature major at Yale. The phrase refers to epiphanies, significant childhood experiences that continue to shape one's adult life. In these paintings, we see Byron co-opting the visual language of abstraction practiced by prominent white male artists and poetic concepts from a canonical white male British artist to make art about his Asian immigrant family. The work also speaks to the central role Byron's family plays as subjects in his art, although they are never directly represented. In 1999, when I was a curator at the Whitney Museum, Byron and I worked on an exhibition at the Whitney's Branch Museum, which was located at the headquarters of the Philip Morris Company on 42nd Street across from Grand Central Station. This branch no longer exists. Byron decided to call the exhibition Whitney Philip Morris. It was an installation of three wall drawings. And I have to say they're very, it's very challenging to show you these wall drawings in this context because they were virtually impossible to photograph. And these are also photographs that were not digital, but transferred from slides. So in some ways you don't even need to see the images because just hearing the conceptual underpinnings of the piece is almost sufficient. While Byron didn't copy any one artist, echoes of many artists resonated on the walls, paying homage to the legendary heroes of the abstract sublime. Uh, on the right, you can see this uh, these brick like um, this brick like pattern, and this is another image of it. This is a, a, a kind of visual pun on Saul Lewitt's descriptive title, "Wall Drawings." One wall on on the wall, Byron decided to use material rather than color to evoke a sense of place which was in this case, the building that housed the Whitney branch at Philip Morris. Philip Morris was a company that sold cigarettes and also owned Kraft Foods. To make this work specific to the site, Byron worked closely with the custodians of the building. He used a translucent silvery gray pigment for the overall color scheme. 
And when you got up close to look at the wall paintings, you could see globs of dust, strands of hair, cigarette butts, and other debris stuck onto the wall. The pigment he concocted, especially for this installation, was made from the contents of vacuum cleaners used by the maintenance workers um, to vac um, at Philip Morris as they went through the building, picking up all of the debris. Every evening, he emptied the contents of their vacuums into buckets and mixed with water and some other um, mysterious solution that I've never figured out that had it, this very silvery, translucent quality. This is just a very bad photo of another one of the wall murals. Um, and there's Byron. Um, the project was in keeping with Byron's interest in transforming truly humble materials into transcendent works of art. These were really very, very beautiful and very subtle works, um, perhaps too subtle for some of our visitors to really appreciate. Uh, and here he is on the ladder with cloth, um, kind of scrubbing the paint, his special pigment mix over the walls. These put a new spin on the term site specificity. Like the spots of time paintings, these convey a sense of loss, not about an individual's past, but of an art historical and cultural past a sense that tr the tradition of formal abstract painting can no longer be taken up unexamined. A rupture with the past that ha has definitely taken place. Earlier on, I mentioned that formal abstraction like Ad Reinhardt's austere black paintings were regarded as the end game of art history. And I think of these three wall murals with, at Philip Morris, as Byron's end game. In the early 2000s, Byron began to make Sunday paintings. Every Sunday, he would make a painting of the sky from direct observation. The format of a 14 inch square canvas um, made the canvases portable enough to carry on travels. After the painting was dry, Byron wrote on the surface of the painting, jotting down something that had happened during the day, often something that had to do with his family. On the left, I'm showing you an installation from his 2018 show at James Cohan Gallery, at which he showed some 100 Sunday paintings from 2001 to 2018. You see them lined up in a row, winding around the gallery. Uh, on the right, you see one of the Sunday paintings, and I, I'm not sure what the text is, but I just want to read you an example I took from one of his Sunday paintings to give you a taste of the kind of thing he recorded on these paintings. So on one painting, he wrote, there was a marine layer, then clear skies, now some puffy clouds moving quickly northeast. This painting should have been made in Fort Lauderdale, but I forgot to bring gray paint. The Rauschenberg residency was transformational for me in unexpected ways. I am more present and aware. My relationship with mom and dad is more relaxed. The highlights so far have been surfing with Ella and getting tacos with Victoria. Mika is eight days old. And he dates, eight. He dates each painting. This one is dated 2-19-20. So it was made during the pandemic three o'clock, Evening Way, La Jolla. Uh, and that is where he spent the pandemic on the West Coast uh, in, near his parents' home. So you can see that these inscriptions are very diaristic and they cover everything from actually the weather and to art making, to his family, his daughter, friends, and the friend's child. When we think about these particular paintings, we also have to think about the term Sunday painter and what that means. We sometimes speak condescendingly of Sunday painters because they regard the activity as a hobby. They're not professionals, but amateurs. But they paint out of love and enjoyment of the activity. 
something Byron admires and aspires to emulate, just the opposite of a careerist. The focus on sky and clouds brings to mind the cloud studies made by John Constable, a renowned 19th century British landscape painter who made cloud studies often making notations of exactly what kind of clouds they were or the weather conditions uh, that he saw on the English countryside as he was painting. His large paintings of the English countryside and rural life are the visual equivalent to the poetry written by romantic poets like Wordsworth, who as we have seen is a touchstone for Byron. Byron borrowed the title of Wordsworth's well-known poem, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud, as the title for his first wall painting in 1997, which is two years before he made his wall paintings at Philip Morris. The poem is about how Wordsworth's spirits were lifted by the memory of a field of daffodils dancing in the breeze. And you can see here that Byron suggests that those moving daffodils with greenery, uh, with this radiant field of yellow pigment. As a companion piece, Byron showed small panels. These are about four inches square, depicting the backs of the heads of his middle daughter and his old, older son, framing the sliver of skin where the hair naturally parts as it grows out of um, one's head. The proximity of these emblematic representations of his children near the landscape touches on the Wordsworthian theme of nature and by extension, the innocent and impressionable nature of childhood. The Sunday paintings are an ongoing project. And I'm just gonna show you, here's another view um, from his show at James Cohan, another view. I think this is um, maybe from the Sharjah Biennial in 2015. And this is definitely from Sharjah. And you can see how these rows, they just wrap around uh, and you walk around and read each, each one of the paintings. Individually or in small groups, they make for a good read that brings together personal and historical markers shown together in a large group as they were recently at the show at James Cohan and at Sharjah. They capture the, the passage of time and create a universe. Byron's view of the world is about the intimacy of family life and the complexity of human relationships and a keen appre appreciation of the ordinariness of everyday activities, which borders on reverence. All of this is set against the sky, a window onto the infinite, which remains indifferent to all that goes on in daily human life. The Synecdoche paintings examine individuals and communities the Sunday paintings regard human existence in the context of the universe. This uh, um, just shows you some of the, um, the format, the 14 inch square painting. Uh, you can see his little notation of the date and location on the lower right. And then just this very um, immaculate pencil writing across the surface of the sky. And the sky, of course, um, you know, he captures the different weather conditions. So some are paler and grayer and some are very, very bright blue. Related to this idea of being a Sunday painter, Byron has spent time in the galleries of the 19th century um, paintings, at, uh, the galleries of 19th century painting at the Metropolitan Museum. And here he is around 2003, making a copy of a portrait by the well-known French painter Jacques-Louis David. Um, he sees this as an opportunity, not only to kind of hone his painting skills, but also to converse with passers-by who stop and talk to him, curious about what he's doing in the galleries. And I don't know if you can see this, but I think it's interesting to note 
that his copy of this female sitter focuses solely on the drapery of her white dress, essentially creating a kind of monochrome painting. The Metropolitan Museum was also the site of a 1996 socially oriented art experiment that Byron undertook with my husband, Tom Finkelpearl. At the time, Tom was a co-director of Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture, a renowned program Byron attended and returned to as a teacher and a governor. Interested in public and community-based art, Tom had come across a 1968 lecture given by no other than Ad Reinhardt to the students and faculty at Skowhegan. The lecture put forth a modernist position advocating the separateness of fine arts from any of the other arts, not to mention life. Reinhardt discussed what happens to works of art when they enter museums. He said, when objects move into a museum of fine art, no matter what they meant at a certain time, at a certain uh, place, they lose all other meanings. You don't have religious objects in the Museum of Fine Art. Sometimes audiences don't believe this when I say it, but all I have to do, all I have to say is try to go up to the Metropolitan Museum or the cloisters and get down and pray. You would get thrown out. So Byron and Tom did just that. Byron meditated in front of Buddhist works and in one gallery, as you see here, oh, in one gallery, he stood before a huge image of Buddha, bowed, kneeled, and touched his head to the floor and stood 108 times in succession. And this is the painting, very well-known painting at the Met. I think you can tell which one just from the, what you're seeing in this um, image. They were not kicked out and their experiment proved Reinhardt's assertion wrong. Looking at Byron's work, in museums today, such as the Brooklyn Museum, also prove Reinhardt's assertion wrong, as his paintings are shown and appreciated for the rich content pertaining to race, individuals, communities, memories, and everyday life as a microcosm of the universe that his works bring to the galleries. Looking toward the future, here are a couple of examples from his most recent body of work entitled BQO. The initials stand for Burton, Quequog, and Odysseus, three important characters from Solaris, Moby Dick, and the Odyssey, three iconic pieces of literature, all dealing with the ocean. The paneled paintings represent real or imagined imagery of the sky, the surface of the water toward the horizon and the view from underwater looking up. He started this new series during his Rauschenberg re residency on Captiva Island, Florida in 2019, the same residency he mentioned in that Sunday painting. And he's been working on them in La Jolla since the beginning of the pandemic. There are representations of the ocean at a fragile time of climate change. Growing up in Southern California, the light and ocean have shaped Byron's personality and artistic vision. I'm looking forward to seeing these new paintings, which will be shown at James Cohan Gallery in January of 2022, as they continue to explore Byron's singular artistic vision. Thank you for joining me today.